All right, so this is just, we're gonna continue on. And again, this might be repetitive, but we're gonna, we're gonna review this every video so that we can really drill the sound, you know, at least for this first case study. So the five Ps, the five pillars, we have to establish the principles, which is that our criteria is gonna be the Quran and the Sunnah. When we determine what is right and wrong, we're gonna use the Quran and the Sunnah, not our own opinions, not so-and-so's opinions, not what so-and-so Sheikh said, we're gonna use the Quran and the Sunnah. We're gonna establish the purpose of our engagement, um, why are we talking? Do you want to lecture me? Do you want to have a dialogue? Do you want to know where you're right and I'm right and you're wrong and I'm wrong? Right? You want to establish that. You want to have, you want to deal with the things in priority. You want to deal with the most pressing issues first, the most important issues first. Um, let's not um, derail the conversation to talk about something that's not as important um, than the major issues. We want to make sure that we're both using proof and evidence, right? establish the conversation, the engagement that is gonna be based on proof and evidence and make sure that it's a parlay, make sure that it's a two-way street, make sure that you both are engaging with each other, that you can have a real conversation and a dialogue. Um, the methodology is that you always want to use the Quran and the Sunnah. Use the Quran and the Sunnah. Use your common sense. Use your common sense. Try to establish a grounds of common sense where you agree upon something outside the context of TMOA then bring that same logic inside the context of TMOA. Um, you can use quotes and teachings of other Sufi sheikhs that contradict the teachings of your cult leader. And you can actually use the contradictions in the statements of your own cult, of not your own, or their own cult leader against them. Be patient, remain focused, make sure you use your leverage, pay attention to power dynamics, and make sure you're clear and direct with what you're communicating to them. Okay, so this is actually a very uh, interesting topic that when I first uh, address, when I first came across this, I was very, I was kind of like shocked that this was even a thing. So <clears throat> when you start questioning these people and you start trying to lead them down um, logical paths to show the falsehood of different things you'll often have to use like hypotheticals to get them to see things, right? And you could tell when they're really like flailing or really in defense mode. And they're when, once they get into defense mode, that means that they're really in a position of like, I don't wanna listen to what this person's saying anymore. But you gotta keep saying it because remember, our job is to deliver the message, okay? Um, and hopefully they think about it later. But you'll see that some of them take this tactic of they don't want to address or answer hypotheticals. So the first time I encountered this was dealing with somebody, um, a SoundCloud rapper from the Jamaat, <laughs> that I straight up asked the person. And I, and I like to use extreme examples because extreme examples help make things pop in your head, right? Um, so I said, if your cult leader, Mubarak Jelani, if you happen as, and the person had a certain type of job, I was like, say you're on a job and your job was at, you know, um, a strip club, right? For some reason, I just making stuff up, right? And you walked inside the strip club, hypothetically, and you see Mubarak Jelani sitting at the bar, drinking liquor, getting like a lap dance and putting dollar bills in like the strippers, uh, whatever, underwear. Um, and again, excuse the example, but I like to use extreme examples. And I was talking to a guy to try to give the most extreme example I could that would be clear that if I seen an alleged sheikh or um, supposed Sufi saint guy that was in a strip club, drinking alcohol, um, engaging in zina and all these different things, that would be a clear sign for someone to say, oh, I should not be following this guy, right? But this person would not answer the question. They're like, I can't answer that question. And I was like, why can't you answer it? He's like, because it's a hypothetical. And I don't know what I would do in the future. And I was like, oh, wow, this is the first time I encountered something like this. Okay. So they try to get out of answering hypotheticals because they know the answer kind of incriminates them. It actually puts them in the situation. Because the reason why you bring up hypotheticals is if they're smart enough to recognize this, is that if you bring up a hypothetical, they know the next thing that you're gonna bring up is the exact situation where 
like their cult leader is guilty of. So if I can, like, for instance, my logic of bringing up that whole scenario was to say, now, if you find out your shake is committing shirk, which is actually a worse sin than being in a strip club, drinking alcohol, or, you know, um, committing fit, uh, uh, um, not fit now, Zena, it's shirk is worse than all of those. So if you find out your, your, your shake teaches shirk, if you would leave them for them committing Zena and drinking alcohol and all these different things that are not fitting for someone that's supposed to be a scholar, then you should leave them if they're teaching shirk. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Like, and what you, again, what you have to do with this is try to bring it outside the context of TMOA, then bring it back inside the context of TM, excuse me, of TMOA. Okay. Because in this situation um, with the individual, we brought up how if we prove that Mubarak Jelani did a halala with his wife, did a haram halala with his wife, will you leave his teachings? Oh, I can't answer that. I can't answer that. Provide a proof. I can't answer that. Yeah, you can answer that. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, qualifications. This is a constant thing that comes up. Okay. Um, they will question your qualifications. They will say that, you know, you're not eligible to speak on these things. You know, as Muslims, you know, Rasulullah Sallam said, and I do not know, the, I don't know which in, in which sahi it's in, um, or which book of hadith it's in, but Rasul Sallam said that convey for me, even if it's one ayat, that if we know something Islamically, it's our duty to actually convey what we know, right? If we have a, a strong understanding of something or a sufficient understanding of something that we can convey it to other people, then we should convey it to other people. Okay. Um, but what they will get into is trying to challenge your qualifications. And put the, again, this is another power dynamic. Remember, trying to gain leverage. They're trying to gain leverage over you by saying that, like, you know, I know more Islam than you. Okay, especially when you're dealing with older generations. Okay, um, so these are some of the quotes he said. Because we asked him, like, okay, well, where have you? You're, like, your question. You're saying that I'm not qualified to speak on these things. Which again, he 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 contradicts himself later. Um, he's saying I'm not qualified to speak on these things. But it's okay. Well, how are you qualified to speak on these things? And, you know, this is, he said, uh, it's, we asked him, like, well, where did you study your Islam? And this is very funny because <laughs> this is a subconscious thing that they, I didn't bring it up in this conversation with them. Hopefully he's watching, but this is a subconscious thing in their head where they actually um, show that they know their sheikh isn't anybody, right? So I, we asked him, where have you studied your Islam? Who qualified you? And then the, his first answer was, I have studied my Islam in the U.S., in New York, in Baltimore, and I was like, well, under who? Like, I was like, well, where? Like, who did you study? Well, what institution? What sheikhs? Who, like, who have you studied under? Right? And get this. And he says, oh, uh, under Sheikh Adam, uh, he was a Qadi in Sudan. <laughs> Notice here, again, I should have brought it up during the conversation, but the conversation was kind of all over the place. Um, he didn't mention Sheikh Mubarak Jalani. <laughs> So if 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 you believe your sheikh is this great teacher, great scholar, this and that, if you truly believe that, even in your own subconscious, if someone says, hey, where'd you learn your Islam from? You'd be like, I learned from Sheikh Mubarak Jelani. Like imagine going to Harvard, right? And someone's like, hey, where did you learn from? And you're like, oh, I went to um, so-and-so middle school and um, you had uh, Fifth Street Avenue, Dawa Center, like whatever. Why wouldn't you mention Harvard University? Right. So, again, subconsciously, he even recognizes that his shake is a nobody and you can't he can't even use him as an authority to say, I learned from Sheikh Mubarak Jelani because he's not a sheikh. He's a cult leader. And you recognize that he's not someone you could reference to other people. Say, I learned from this person. Um, he also said that uh, uh, shirk is a field that I wasn't qualified to give an opinion on, which he contradicts himself, which I'll point out later. Um, he says, are we in kindergarten? And again, these are these, like these, uh, we're, we have to remain patient because these are like, sl like slights. These are ways he's trying to insult and trying to like push my buttons or they'll try to push your buttons because if they get you to act out of character, then they can use that as an excuse to not listen to what you're saying to them. So you really have to keep composure. You really have to push these insults off to the side and you can even bring it up to him, which I brought up to him during our conversation was like, you keep trying to insult me and I haven't insulted you once. 
Um, he says you need to investigate things. And remember, we just established that, um, for instance, in this situation, I actually knew more about the Jamaat than he did. Remember, he's disconnected. He distanced himself. He didn't know about the Sheikh's teachings. He didn't know about what's going on inside the Jamaat. But he's telling us that we need to investigate things. Okay. Um, then he said, he straight out said, you are ignorant based on your qualifications and on your education, which then I asked him, I said, what is my qualifications? What is my education? And he didn't know. So if you don't, if don't let them try to, you know, pull. So like, again, we're talking, I'm going to talk specifically to the TMOA people. Most of you guys have been to retreats, right? And you receive the same Islamic education as everybody else inside of the Jamaat. So no one inside of the Jamaat can sit there and say, yeah, I'm more Islamically educated than you because we all went through the same thing. You learn from your parents, you learn from the retreats. There's a very few people that studied Islam outside of that besides personal study. And if you're here and if you're outside of the Jamaat dealing with people inside the Jamaat, that means you did enough personal study, probably definitely more than them to learn your Islam. So you are qualified to speak on these matters. Um, and then he straight up, it was, it was funny, he straight up said, that he was qualified by Allah himself, that Allah himself qualified him to speak on these topics. And then he said straight up, Allah taught me. Like, and this is this goofy Sufi stuff where, you know, like I'm getting education straight from Allah and this is what qualified me. If this was the, were the case, then Rasulullah wouldn't have taught the Sahabas, the Sahabas wouldn't have taught all their students and so on and so forth, all the way till that we have um, Isnad, or we have Ijazah, or we have a chain for all the science of Islam that goes straight back to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So this idea of like, oh, Allah taught me and I just know and I can speak on these things, you know, if that's if that's true for you, then that's true for me. And I could just say, yeah, Allah, Allah taught me too, you know? So just pay attention to always try to check your qualifications. They'll try to say that you're not qualified to speak on things. They'll, they'll throw insults at you and say you're ignorant. Be patient with those, put them to the side, really stay focused on the topic at hand and really trying to get them to see the contradictions in how they think. And remember, keep the Quran and Sunnah in line, um, in mind. Remember, and according to the Quran and Sunnah, um, we have to have an isnad for our teachings. We have to have qualified teachers. Um, we have to have uh, teachers that teach according to the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, so anybody just saying like, yeah, I'm qualified to speak on this, I'm a sheikh, I'm learned, I'm this and that, off of their own whims, that's not how Islam works. That's not how Islam works. So uh, we'll stop here and we'll, we'll keep on going um, in another video.